with Brain Jamie Fit. Let's receive him. Put your hands together for Jamie Fit. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, actually a gentleman who ministered here a couple years ago at one of our conferences, Will Ford. And part of what Will has done in his ministry is give time and energy to even seeing stadiums filled with these kinds of gatherings, gatherings where people humble themselves and pray. And he said, you know, I think it's not an accident that I've, you know, I've labored and others have labored for years to see stadiums filled with people praying. And on January 2nd of this year, God called a prayer meeting for a man named Damar Hamlin. And all of a sudden, a stadium was filled. And we got one of the best pictures of what revival prayer looks like. I'm telling you, God's bringing us to a place of desperation he's bringing us to a place where we recognize it's life or death and as a man's life hung in the balance a stadium filled with people and people all around this nation began to pray for that man and you talk about revival that's revival he died twice and the Lord said no I will raise him up come on And could there be a message in it for us? Could God be saying, see, when that happened, the game was over. The competition was over. Could God be saying, if you'll stop playing games, if you'll stop competing with one another and begin to cry out for revival, I will send the revival you're crying out for. I will raise it up. I will cause the body to come together and be revived again. So we want to go deeper. And my brother just mentioned Isaiah 6. I want to bring us there for a moment. And if the folks who are praying with me would come on up. Pastor Dave Greenockle, that's my pastor. Pastor Freddie Thomas. Pastor John Blaine, if you guys would come up, please. See, I love Isaiah 6 because Isaiah has a moment where part of what he realizes is that his sin is culturally acceptable. When he says, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. I believe what he's understanding is that things he thought were okay because everybody was doing it. God's saying it's not okay. And so we see some things, and here's where I want us just to begin in this segment. We're continuing on with 2 Chronicles 7, 14. We're going to seek the face of God and then turn from our wicked ways. And there's some wicked ways in us that we don't even realize are wicked ways. And we've just been led in a beautiful uh, individual repentance. But I know if there's more than 30 churches here tonight, then we could come together and we could do something on behalf of the church of Philadelphia and say, Lord, we want to come and we want to repent for the ways we've treated each other. We want to repent for the competition that's normal and that we think is okay, but God, you're not okay with it. We want to repent for the ways that churches talk bad about each other and different groups. Now, I know, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here tonight, but y'all know what I'm talking about. It's not you, it's everyone else. But could we stand in a place tonight of saying, Lord, we saw what you did on January 2nd. We want to quit playing games. We want to quit the competition between each other. We want to quit judging one another. Well, I don't, we don't do it that way at our church. Yeah, that's why God has you and he has the other one and he has all the others. He's doing it on purpose. Amen. So I want us to pray into this just for a moment. I'm going to ask Pastor Dave to come. 
and read Psalm 51 and just pray into this. But can we stand together tonight? Can we do something? Come on, I always believe our prayer meetings are bigger than the room we're in. Can we have faith to say tonight, Lord, as a representation of the Church of Philadelphia, we know there's many, many others. We're saying tonight, Lord, we want to repent on behalf of the Church of Philadelphia. We want to come to a place of personal repentance, but we want to say, Lord, as a church body, we're going to do better. We're going to do, do the turn. That's really what repentance is, right? It's turning from one way and going the other way. We're not just going to stop talking bad about other people. We're going to come together as one. Amen? And it was in the days that kings go out to battle that David stayed in Jerusalem. And he looked out and he saw Bathsheba. And instead of building up the kingdom of God, he chose to pursue the lusts of the flesh. I feel like as Jamie was saying right here before reading Psalm 51, it's the context. It's really a corporate repentance of saying, have I been building up the kingdoms of men? Or have I been building up the kingdom of God? Have I been seeking out the lusts of the flesh? Or have I been seeking out the kingdom of God? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not seek ye first the building of your church. But in God's mercy. Come on. Yeah. But in God's mercy he sends a Nathan. Hebrew and Natan, a gift. The prophet, the one who gives correction is a gift. And David had an opportunity, and I believe today the church of Philadelphia has an opportunity to either go the way that we've been going or to repent before the Lord. Because now is the time for the church to go out to battle. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak. And blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners shall be converted to you. Father, we come before you and we say, Lord, the gift of repentance. Father, we repent as a corporate body. With the spirit of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the world, of trying to potentially build up our own kingdoms. Yeah. Oh, we are to build up yours. Yes, Lord. Wash up with hyssop. The very article that was used to put the, the blood on the post and lintel of Passover. Hyssop, the very item that was dipped in the gall to give unto Jesus, the cleansing agent of Jesus. then and it's then through their repentance your word says that I shall preach to the transgressor and they will repent from their sin Lord could it be that we have not seen a repentance of the transgressor because we first have not repented Father we pray that through our repentance that there would be a demonstration of your power on earth in Philadelphia. Amen.
Thank you, Father. Can we go a little deeper? The Lord took me to Isaiah 54 a couple years ago. And he took me to verse 8. This is out of the New Living Translation because it translates it well. It says, in a burst of anger, I turned my face away for a little while. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And I read these words, and the Lord had been speaking to me about what a terrifying thing it is when God says, I will hide my face from you. We have no idea what that means. But you see, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, if you will turn and seek my face. But what happens when God says, now I will hide my face from you? And it doesn't matter where you turn, you can't find the face of God. It's probably one of the most terrifying things God can say in all the scriptures is I'm hiding my face from you. And there are very few times that God says it. But in Isaiah 54, he says it here in a lot of translations say, with a little wrath, I hid my face from you. Let me tell you, it's not a little wrath. It's a good translation when it says a burst of anger. But let me tell you the, the deep revelation that God gave me. Are you ready for this? You're going to have to really prepare your spirit, man. He said Isaiah 53 comes before Isaiah 54. That's deep, isn't it? And he said to me, do you understand that that burst of anger, that wrath, was when I turned my face from my son on the cross and Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Lord says, I turned my face on my son in that moment so I'd never have to turn my face from any one of my sons and daughters again. And verse 9 says, just as I swore in the time of Noah that I would never again flood or cover the earth, so now I swear that I will never again be angry and punish you. Hallelujah. Listen to me. We are the ones who live on the, the, the other side of Isaiah 53. We live on the other side of the suffering servant who bore all of our transgressions and iniquities and sins and burdens. But the question is, will we turn and seek his face? And with the few minutes we have left, I want us to pray into this because hear my heart. We live in a, in a city of unbelievable need. We are one of the poorest big cities in the nation, the poorest. We are one of the highest violent cities in the nation. We know we have opioid issues. Listen, I, I, I don't want to give the devil any more credit, but I'm going to tell you, we all know the issues. And let me say that it is very easy for those immediate demands to overwhelm all of our time and attention. And for a moment when the Lord says, listen, seek my face. Come on. Can we repent tonight? for the ways that we have allowed the demands of even the good to overcome God. Can we repent tonight and say, Lord, we are taking this time and we will take other times as you lead us and you guide us to seek your face. It's not a luxury, it's a necessity. Come on, Father, we say today, tonight, we wanna be people of your presence people who live out of the secret place lord we turn from our unrighteous ways and we seek your face father we repent tonight for even the times and the places lord where the, the demands of ministry as good as they are 
Lord, have taken us out of your presence and taken us out of the place where we live in your presence. Father, we're asking you tonight that you would forgive and you would turn our hearts. And Father, just begin to cleanse and purify in Jesus' name. Grab hold of the hand of someone next to you. Amen. Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you, Lord, because the church in Philadelphia belongs to you. Lord, this church belongs to one who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You are the Lord of this church. You are the God of this church. You are the king of this church. You are the savior of this church. You are the master of this church. You are the founder of this church. You are the author of this church. You are the perfecter of this church. And without you, we are nothing. So Father, other than seeking your face, we have nothing else to do, O Lord. We thank you, Lord. We are praying for revival. Lord, we thank you. When you started restoring your church, you brought the revival of salvation. Then you brought the revival of holiness. Then you brought the revival of the spirit. Then you brought the revival of power. Then you brought the revival of grace. And we thank you. Now you're bringing the revival of sonship for the creation is eagerly awaiting for the revelation of the sons of God. And Father, the sons are in this room right now. Lord, the solution for Philadelphia is in this room. And Lord, we cannot do it on our strength. Lord, we need you. We seek your face. We are dependent on you. You are all we got. And you are what we got. And you are all that we need. So we thank you, Jesus. May our eyes never be taken off from you. May our eyes be fixed on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. May our churches be all about you and you alone. May our ministries be all about you yes. and you alone. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. As I have read over the years this verse, Second Chronicles 7.14, it seems how the Lord subtly moves into the scripture. It starts out by saying, humble yourself. And that doesn't seem so harsh. And, okay, yeah, I guess I need to humble myself. Then he tells us to pray. Yeah, um, I, I believe in prayer. That, that I can do that. Yeah, okay. And he says, seek my face. And that, that goes a little more, uh, a little more earnest in, in, in prayer, seeking and then he hits him with the sledgehammer. Turn from your wicked ways. Wait, are you talking about this crowd or the other team? And I began to think about that. And the first thing that came to my mind was Isaiah 59, where it says, uh, is the arm of the Lord or the hand of the Lord wax short that he cannot save? Is his ear heavy that he cannot hear? But the message Bible says, is my arm amputated? Have I gone deaf? And then he goes on to list all of the, the horrible things that the, the people were doing. And I heard mentioned already Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said, Woe is me. I have, I'm undone. I have wicked speech. I, I, I'm around people who speak wickedly. You know, for the first five chapters, he was still a prophet. But it wasn't until six he realized that I'm undone and have unclean lips. You know, the Bible says that if we walk in the spirit, we would not fulfill the lust and the desires of the flesh. And I was teaching our young people uh, not too long ago. I said, 
that word lust there doesn't necessarily mean all of the perversions that we're hearing about today. It simply means you're doing what your flesh desires to do rather than what God wants you to do. So as I read through Isaiah 59, and I'm thinking about all these horrible things, wicked ways, uh, Apostle Jamie came to me and said, we're going to do this, and I want you to be in the second part. And he said, you have wicked ways. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> do you know something I don't know? But then I thought about, about Jesus. He gave talents out to his servants, or he talks about a master who gives talents out to his servants. And you know you know the story. You're, you're all good Bible scholars. He gave one five, and he invested and got five more and had ten. And the second one, he had two, and he invested and got two. But one did nothing. He said, I want to keep this. I want to preserve this thing. I dig the hole in the earth, and I buried it. And here, Lord, aren't you proud of me? I, I, I've given you this. I've not lost anything. You know what he said of this servant who didn't lose anything? You are a wicked and slowful servant. God has given us talents that we've hidden in the earth. And we've not used to, to bring in the harvest. I met a man by the name of Philip Heflin, Apostle Philip Heflin. I believe was a cousin to Ruth Heflin. And he said, there's no such thing as shyness in the kingdom. Because I used to always call myself shy. I can't get in front of crowds. And he said, it's not shy, it's selfish. You just want to keep what God has given to you, to you. That was another kick in the pants. But, but as you read down that, that, that chapter 59 in Isaiah, it says, God looked and he said, there was no man, there was no intercessor, there was no one who was praying and seeking my face. And then he said, and then it says, it was the strong arm of the Lord that brought salvation. You see, it started in verse one saying, is, my arm is not short, but he said, it's my arm that brought about salvation. And because my arm has brought about your salvation in Isaiah 60, you can arise and shine and display the glory of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. God, we, we, we've been saved. We've given you our heart. We've, we've gotten good at church. We've gotten good at performance. And somehow we've been able to bury the wicked ways. But, oh, God, I pray that you slice us open as we lay on the altar. God, we, we fillet ourselves open that you would dissect out every wicked way, everything that is not like you, everything that is contrary, all the times that we've held back from utilizing our talents for your glory. God, we thank you. We thank you that it is not you that have looked away from us, but we have looked away from you. And now, God, we turn. We turn back to you and surrender our all. And God, we want to be living sacrifices, living but dead, dead to our will, but alive to do all that you've commanded us to do. Help us never to be conformed to the things of this world, but help us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. God, we're here tonight that you might renew our minds, that you would saturate every fiber of our being with your Holy Spirit. God, we just don't want to be full. We want to be overflowing. You said out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul says, I'm poured out for the sakes of the gospel. God, fill us and pour us out. I used to say, God, fill me and spill me. But spill is accidental. God says, I'm intentional about this thing. There are those that I want you to reach as an individual. God, pour me out in the places that you would have me poured out. For we live at the mercy of the King. God, we ask these things in your precious name for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen.